Good morning, everyone. Uh, so we are going to have our uh, novel architecture session now. So our first paper is Rethinking Programmable Erable Processor. So the author is the author is Nathan Blair. He's a PhD student in University of Illinois Albana Champaign. He works with Professor Rakesh Kumar. His research interest is in architecture for emerging technology and design automation. Hello, can everybody hear me? All right. Uh, just bear with me a second. We were a little uh, late getting set up, so. Am I, do we have this uh, broadcasting on Zoom? I can't tell. Okay. Hi. My name is Nathan Blyer. I worked on this research with Husnain Mubarak, Srijan Chakrabarti, Shreyas Kishor, and my professor Rakesh Kumar. In this talk, I will argue that ear and head worn wearables or earables are going to be the next big computing platforms. And I will discuss how we should design computer architectures for these earable computing platforms. The vision of earable computing revolves around having a rich variety of head and ear worn wearables devices, such as headphones, earbuds, and hearing aids, each equipped with a plethora of sensors and actuators, which come with programmable hardware, which enables a rich variety of applications, such as indoor localization and navigation, head, face, and mouth activity sensing, vibratory communication, health and vital sign sensing, and machine translation. Users interact with earable devices using audio and haptic-based human machine interfaces. The earable vision is, being, is on the cusp of being realized because complex sensors are being added to current earable platforms. And these are enabling new applications. And we believe this list of sensors will continue to grow. Current audio SOCs include programmable hardware, which is required to support a wide variety of complex earable applications. There has been a recent proliferation of enabling technologies, most notably the development of transformer networks, which have enabled human quality results in natural language understanding benchmarks. And as a platform, earables are already ubiquitous with a large and fast growing global market. As a result, we believe that earables will be the next big computing platform. Further, the time is right for the development of an earable application system. The question we ask, what hardware architectures will drive the earable computing platforms? To answer this question, we first need to identify representative earable application software. We constructed a suite of, of representative earable applications, EarBench. To collect the EarBench applications, we surveyed over 50 papers, interviewed earable computing domain experts, and analyzed applications. We classified applications into four categories. Human machine interface applications enable the wearer to interact with the earable via voice commands. The applications include small and large vocabulary speech recognition and voice identification applications. Audio applications enable dynamic multi-source spatial audio using ambisonics and signal processing techniques which model the human head and ear anatomy. Spatial awareness applications enabling tracking the position and movement of the wearer, including in indoor locations where GPS and cellular based tracking systems struggle. Analytics applications perform heavyweight analysis of data collected by earable sensors. With a collection of earable applications, evaluation of various hardware architectures becomes possible. To identify which hardware architectures will drive earable platforms, we first evaluated models of current earable processors on EarBench. We used GEM5 to evaluate scalar and superscalar ARM cores, roughly modeled off of Cortex M4 and Cortex M7, which are found in contemporary audio SOCs, as well as the Cortex A53. We determined performance requirements for the applications by a consultation with domain experts. This figure shows the performance speedups required by each of the 
pre-modeled cores on ear bench applications. As such, higher is worse. The first thing to note is that performance requirements of several applications, such as the lightweight transformer Albert and the extended Kalman filtering cannot be met by any of the model cores. Other applications could be targeted by the larger core, but not by the smaller low power cores. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that several of the applications have multiple versions. In HRTF2, the spatial audio stream is constructed from two audio sources, while in HRTF8, the spatial audio stream is constructed from eight distinct audio sources. As such, while cores can support the lightweight version of the HRTF benchmark, they are unable to support the heavyweight version of the benchmark. The hardware and contemporary audio SOCs is unable to support future earable applications by a large margin. But performance is only the first part of the gap between existing audio SOC hardware and earable applications. We saw that while contemporary audio SOC hardware could not support EarBench, the beefier core modeled off of a Cortex A53 did perform significantly better. However, there are still energy constraints which suggest simply scaling up the size and complexity of audio SOC microcontrollers is not a good approach. Consider a typical earable battery, such as that found in Apple's AirPods. This figure shows the number of runs each model core can execute on the energy budget of the battery. This means we can support less than one hour of ambisonic audio processing and only half an hour of ECG data analysis. From an energy perspective, the modeled hardware is insufficient and provides a low quality user experience. To understand why this is, we looked at the benchmarks in more detail. This graph shows the amount of time spent in seven computational kernels by the EarBench applications. The majority of computation time is thus spent in signal processing and machine learning workloads. This is a good thing as these workloads have strong similarities. Here's the computation of an output in a fully connected layer of a neural network. And here's the computation of an output of a discrete Fourier transform. The similarities are clear from this perspective. Both fully connected layers and DFTs are simply transforming an input vector with a linear transformation. We know that ML accelerators are good at performing fully connected layers and other machine learning workloads. However, ML accelerators are not good at computing DFTs as they cannot exploit DFT symmetries. That is, they cannot compute fast Fourier transforms and they typically don't natively support complex arithmetic. Digital signal processors, however, are designed to compute FFTs and can exploit DFT symmetries effectively using bit reverse addressing and auto loop instructions. However, DSPs cannot exploit the parallelism available in large matrix computations the way ML accelerators can. Mobile GPUs can support both computations, but they also come with significant overhead, such as a dedicated graphics pipeline hardware and require relatively large workload sizes to reach full efficiency. We need hardware which efficiently supports both DSP and machine learning kernels. So what does hardware actually need to support both DSP and machine learning kernels? The key computation of matrix vector and matrix matrix multiplication of ML kernels is the multiply accumulate with a large amount of parallelism. Thus, we need high throughput MAC units. As such, we need an even balance between multipliers and adders. Also, as different neural networks have different input, output, and filter sizes, it is important that the hardware is able to effectively support workloads of various sizes. Complex arithmetic is required for FFTs and frequency domain computations found frequently in DSP applications. Thus, hardware needs to support natively complex arithmetic. The FFT butterfly is a visual representation of the FFT computation. By exploiting symmetries in the twiddle factors, the FFT enables computation of the DFT in n log n time. Thus, hardware needs to be able to exploit, exploit DFT symmetries and hence support the fast Fourier transform. To support the irritable application workloads, we designed Speak, 
or, speech, or spatial earable computer. Speak's main computational fabric is a coarse grained reconfigurable array designed to accelerate machine learning and DSP tasks. The distribution tree is a fat tree of switches which route data streams into a collection of buffers. In turn, buffers feed a collection of 16 fixed point multipliers. The multipliers products are fed into the augmented reduction tree, which performs reductions, accumulations, and linear or ReLU activations. The lateral links found in both the multiplier nodes and the augmented reduction tree nodes are used to enable data flows for various kernel sizes. Speak CGRA is modeled after the MARI machine learning accelerator, which like Speak uses distribution and reduction trees to perform the dot products which make up the bulk of the linear transformations in machine learning kernels. But unlike MARI, Speak also needs to support DSP workloads. To support DSP workloads, we need to support complex arithmetic. Thus, we, we create logical vector multi multipliers out of pairs of adjacent multiplier nodes. These support two modes. In standard mode, the data is routed as in a real arithmetic workload. In exchange mode, the second operands to adjacent multipliers are swapped. Similarly, we create logical vector adders out of adjacent adders in the bottom layer of the augmented reduction tree. In these LVAs, the left adder can be configured to perform either addition or subtraction. This enables a pair of adjacent LVMs and LVA to perform complex multiplication by placing the first LVM into standard mode, the second LVM into exchange mode, and the left adder into subtraction mode. Complex input streams are multicast into both LVMs, in this way, the left adder outputs the real value and the right adder outputs the complex value of the complex product. The CGRA fabric is only one part of Speak hardware. Speak's system is design, design is based off of the SoftBrain general purpose programmable accelerator. Speak comes with a control core, which is used to configure the CGRA substrate and streaming engines, which feed the substrate. The control core is also used to perform computations not supported by the CGRA. Data streams are generated by streaming engines attached to the system memory and dedicated scratch pad. Streams implement 3D affine addressing, meaning they can generate streams equivalent to a triply nested loop. The recurrent stream engine feeds data streams from the output of the CGRA back into its input. And the bitstream generator is used to generate streams of control pits, which are used to manage the accumulators. Speak is a general purpose computer with a tightly integrated programmable ML and DSP accelerator. We modeled it in Gem5 using the DSA Gen framework, which enables us to perform kernel evaluations on Speak. Here are our kernel speed ups results of Speak versus the three modeled MCUs. We also compare against measured results on a 10 silica high 54 DSP, which is a typical DSP in audio SOCs. On average, Speak outperforms the DSP by 6x and outperforms all of the MCUs by at least 10x and up to 100x. But performance is not the entire story. A high performance, high power machine would be equally unsuitable for battery powered durables. This figure shows Speak's energy improvement over the MCUs and DSP. Speak is twice as energy efficient as the smallest MCU and over 50 times more energy efficient than the highest performance microcontroller. We evaluated benchmark kernels on a four shader core on four shader cores of a Mali T628 GPU using standard library and hand optimized implementations. While the GPU's performance was comparable or better than Speak's for large kernel sizes, as seen in the left figure, the right figure shows that Speak is one to three orders of magnitude more energy efficient than a mobile GPU for these workloads. We also evaluated Speak against models for Mary and Iris, state-of-the-art machine learning accelerators. Although the dedicated ML accelerators outperform Speak on ML kernels, their inability to perform fast Fourier transforms was a massive liability for DFT computations. You'll also notice that not all kernels are evaluated on the ML accelerators. This is due to the fact that these missing kernels cannot be mapped to the special purpose ML accelerator hardware which presents a need for an architecture like Speak. 
sum up, we have highlighted that earbuds are, the, are poised to be the next big consumer computing platform as enabling technologies and algorithms come online. What we show in this work is that earbud applications are dominated by machine learning and digital signal processing kernels. And that existing audio SOCs are ill-suited to support earbud applications. We propose a general purpose computer, Speak, which incorporates a tightly coupled ML and DSP accelerator. Speak greatly outperforms current audio SOC processors, and it's far more efficient than mobile GPUs. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I, I will ask you a question. <clears throat> uh, so you, you showed the difference of your um, enable processor with uh, ML accelerator. So the main difference is it, it is supposed to basically support more complex operations. So, and the example that you've given is DFT, right? So is that the only uh, complex operation that it needs to support or there are other, other types of operation that it needs to support? So the, um... The, the, the question, if I understand it, was, was uh, the addition of the F support for complex arithmetic and FFT uh, data flows, um, the only addition that we added to it over like base. Uh, so basically the question is the example, uh, the DFT is kind of your representative example, the operations that you want to support. So mm -hmm. what other similar applications that you can support in your? In your oh, I see. Um, so uh, when we compare it to, uh, to something like uh, Iris, the, the, it's, um, Iris is very constrained in what it can support based on its design, right? So um, anything that is basically anything that's not uh, um, uh, built out of uh, matrix matrix multiply, Iris is gonna struggle with. So Iris will do, of course, convolution layers very, very well. Uh, it can do dense layers as well. Um, but anything that involves, uh, um, um, things other than that it struggles with. So we had a, a number of kernels which we couldn't even map onto that into that fabric. So things like uh, Cholesky decomposition, LU decomposition, we, we simply can't even map onto uh, a, um, an accelerator like uh, Iris or Mary for that matter. So both of those ones, we, we could only evaluate them on, I think four out of the seven uh, kernels that we used. Hi, Yiping Chang, Universal Mission. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you for the talk, it's really interesting. My quick question is kind of <clears throat> looking beyond the arable, right? The, how well do you think the architecture and some of the insights will apply to like just wearable in general? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. This architecture will not, I don't think this architecture will generalize to like, you're not gonna put this in a, in a, in a, in a data center, I don't think, um, for a number of reasons. This architecture is, is um, very much focused on, um, on the context of wearable devices, right. uh, especially. So, yeah, that was what I meant, right? But, but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, though, um, we, we, for our, our, our design, we borrow heavily from SoftBrain, which, which uh, is, is a general purpose uh, uh, accelerator that is actually being built in, in now and uh, uh, um, is being sold as a uh, general purpose design for, for arbitrary computation. So we, we did a lot of things that would make us more constrained than that. Um, and those were to optimize for ultra low power. So uh, for example, um, from Mary, we take this very atypical uh, CGRA topology and the CGRA topology is really designed to perform inner products. Um, so if you have, if you have workloads that are, are not uh, doing a lot of inner products, uh, it's, it's, you would choose a, a more general uh, grid-like topology for your, your substrate. I see, yeah. thank you. Thanks for the question. John Demme, Microsoft. Can you elaborate on what exactly is going on in your distribution tree network? The, the upper network, it was simply a reduction network, but you didn't fill in the little bubbles in your, dis, uh, in your, uh, yeah, in your distribution tree to say what was going on there. Yeah, sure. Um, it, we have more detail of it in the in the paper itself. Uh, so it's maybe this is not showing all the information in this in this cartoon graphic. Um, but what you have is in each each one of those those circles uh, is an it has at a minimum an adder. Uh, several of them have 
accumulators as well. Uh, so they, some of them are, can be configured to perform accumulations, while others are just performing the, the reduction. Um, then the, it, I'm trying to, we're trying to visualize it with the, the way that the, the, uh, in the augmented reduction tree, the, all of the, the higher levels of the, of the connections are thicker. Uh, and this is to, to show that it's a fat tree. So you're able to, um, you're, you're able to, you, you don't have, you don't necessarily have to do a full reduction, right? So you can have multiple accumulators in parallel that are doing accumulations and you can still output all of that data uh, in parallel um, to the output streaming ports. And the distribution tree is doing the same? So yes, the distribution okay. tree. Well, the distribution tree is, is not really doing any computation itself. The, the distribution tree is just routing data using a fat tree. And how does it do that? Like, why why is it a tree versus a direct connection to a register file? Uh, so that's be, that's because if you have, for example, um, a, a three by three filter versus a five by five filter uh, on, in your convolution layer, um, the routing is going to be different. So it's basically a bit twiddling network. Basically, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's give the speaker a round of applause. <laughs> So our next speaker is DU. He's currently a fifth year PhD student in uh, EC Department of University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, he's advised by Professor Joshua San Miguel. His research interest is in the low power computer architecture using emerging computing schemes, including unary computing, approximate computing, and reconfigurable computing. <clears throat> So he's in the job market looking for industrial and academic jobs. So feel free to reach out to him. So he's going to talk about brain computer interface. Can you hear me? Okay, I suppose. Hey, let's start. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk, U Brain, uh, Unary Brain Computer Interface. Then back in time, people have already 
uh, imagine the existence of brain computer interface for short BTIs in scientific movies. And just through all years, we can see that the size of the BTIs grow smaller and smaller, which motivates our work to bring to uh, build our more power efficient BCIs. Then let's see some background about the BTI and the unit computing in this work. The, in the real world, BTIs has already been used for uh, prosthetic control, uh, text imagery, a uh, video game. So a formal definition of the BTI is a computer system that uh, manipulating the brain signals to control, classify, communicate, and predict uh, and beyond in real time. And among multiple uh, brain signals, EEG signals are collected at the scalp without any surgery. And we focus on the EEG signal in this work. Then the, on the right is the EEG based BTI framework. Uh, you usually classically have five stages, including the uh, signal acquisition, pre-processing, feature extraction, and classification, and finally, uh, optional feedback stimulus. Recently, with the rise of the DNN, there's a trend that the middle three stages in gray are merged into a single DNN. And this urine is targeting this kind of DNN-based BTIs. Here is an example of such BTI. So on the left is the uh, electrode placement on the scalp. And those scalp, uh, those electrodes will collect the data and positionally map them into a matrix. This is called the mesh clip. Then the mesh clip are fed to the DNA. This DNA has three hierarchy, three uh, stages. The first stage is a CN. So each CN is trying to work on a single, a uh, single mesh clip from a single time step and to extract the spatial features. And the second stage is the LSTM. Those spatial features are then uh, processed to extract those temporal features. So finally, those spatial temporal features are classified at the FC layer. Then we move to the conventional data flow of BCIs. Classically, we need the sensors. And then after the data are sensed, we need to store them in the DRAM or whatever. Usually classical BTIs works on, for example, algorithms like SBM, FFT. Those kind of algorithms have to collect all the data before compute. This means the compute is never overlapped with the uh, sense stage. This means kind of we are wasting the time during the sense for compute. In this work, we propose immediate processing, which is it's the immediate signal processing after sensing. What it did is we collect the data using the sensor and directly convert it to unary bit streams. And right after the data are converted, we start the compute. So in this case, we overlap the compute with the sense stage. This means longer, a longer runtime, lower frequency, and finally lower power, achieving our goal of power efficient brain computer interface. Next, let's see some background about the unary computing, how it pro provides high uh, power efficiency. The unary data are serial bit strings. For example, here we first have a 0 0.5 value there. Assume the final bit stream length is 16 bit. So it should have eight ones in the bit stream. To encode those ones, we have different methods. The first method we call it rate coding. The rate coding in the rate coding, for example, A here, the ones are randomly distributed. And those bit streams are generated by compare the original source data with a random number generator at the top of bottom left. And the second kind is a temporal coding. So usually we will, in this kind of uh, coding, the ones are consecutive and also the zeros are consecutive. And to generate those temporal coded bit stream, we need to compare the source data with the counter output. So using those bit streams, we can design multiplier, adder, or even more complicated functions with very simple logic. 
here we show examples of multiplier and adder here. It uh, the multiplier is essentially an end gate. It works on both temper stream and rate stream. And for the adder, the very initial design is a, just a max. Then a later on improvement to uh, provide higher accuracy is just based on, for example, two bit accumulator here with its carry bit as an output. This is pretty simple. And oops. so with those in mind, we have, uh, take a look overview of the Ubrin. We consider our design as a BCI compute engine with algorithm hardware code design. It has, it has two major features. First is its minimum accuracy loss via customized DNA with the piecewise linear activation. The second is high active, uh, power efficiency via immediate processing. This is hardware efficiency is a, achieved by three uh, architecture or microarchitecture optimizations listed below. The first one is the interlayer hardware time deficient multiplexing. Second is analog to temporal conversion. And lastly is the low cost temporal multiplier. Then we also compare where at a very high level of our design with prior works using, CP, uh, uh, using CPU and Halo and uh, SVM based designs. Our design has uh, relatively high accuracy because we are operating on um, emerging DNs instead of classical FFT or SCVM based algorithms. And also because of our unit computing nature, we can provide high power efficiency compared to other designs. So with those uh, overview in mind, let's move to the first phase, the algorithm design. In this work, we target uh, two tasks. The first is the motor imagery. The motor imagery is that in your mind, you are imagining you are doing some action. And later on, the BCI try to classify what you are imagining in your mind. Here are uh, five output categories. The second task is the serial prediction. You are trying to, uh, the BCI is trying to classify whether a serial is onset or not onset in your mind. Then we move to the, our customized DA. So first is we need a DNA that's small enough, but provide, still provides good enough accuracy. So this is the shape of the, uh, uh, our new network and it's already minimized compared to the original algorithm. And the second optimization is the simplified activation functions for unit computing. So what we actually did is convert the ReLU function, the sigma function and tangent function to their hard versions. By hard versions, I mean, okay, simply piecewise linear activation. Those activations are very uh, easy to implement for unit computing. For example, we check out the hardware sigmoid. It's essentially a, a adder. So we just use the previous two, uh, two bit accumulator based addition for hardware sigmoid, hard sigmoid. Then let's move to the hardware or uh, the architecture. Here's a very high level overview of our architecture. So for each layer in the DN, we allocate a separate hardware block. Those blocks are fully pump line. We can see uh, and the, the dash line there means the double buffer between each layer so that we can separately individually process the data from different time steps. The first block ATC means directly convert the analog signal to the temporal bit strips so that it can be consumed by the following stages seamlessly. This means we can, with this architecture, we can achieve the immediate signal processing after setting. Next, let's see the optimizations that allows this feature immediate processing. First, it's a data flow with the interlayer hardware time division multiplexing. So as I said, each layer has its own dedicated hardware. So basically we can just sense the data from the time step zero and send it to comp one block. In the next time step, 
the data from time step zero will move to count two block. And a new data from time step one will come in and process by count one. So in this case, we can process everything in a fully pumpline manner, achieving the hardware time division multiplexing. Then at the, at the uh, micro architecture level, we have this analog to temporal conversion. As I mentioned, we need to sense the data and directly convert those data into bit streams. So here is the diagram. We sense the brain signals and buffer the raw signal in the analog memory. The second step is to just compare the buffer signal with a linear wrap signal. This will produce a temporal bit stream. This temporal bit stream will be directly convert, uh, consumed by COMP1 block. And by consume those bit stream, I actually mean we do the gen, we do the LSTM. So we need a low cost multiplier. Here is the temporal multiplier we proposed on the top. It works, uh, it's based on the previous end gate, but here is, uh, it's, it's a more compli uh, complicated version working on signed data. And it, can, it has one input to be rate coded, another input to be temper coded. And on the bottom is a prior work that works on two rate coded bit strings. Our design achieved error reduction because we reduced the number of random number generators from three at the bottom to one at the top. The big error saving is uh, results from the RNG here is the most costly part in this kind of multiplier. Then keeping all those algorithms, architecture details in mind, okay, we move to the evaluation. First, let's take a look at the accuracy. This is a, what we care by coding line. The customized DNA is, uh, works for both uh, the motor imagery and the serial pr prediction but we need different weights for them. And we show the result with different data bit widths here, ranging from four to 12 for fixed point design and another uh, folding point design for the, from the CPU. For the CISO array with uh, integer data at around eight bit, we could see that the accuracy is still good, but the accuracy will fall short at around uh, seven bit. So for CISO array baseline, we will use eight bit for the full, uh, later on hardware evaluation. And then for the SC design, stochastic computing design and our U-brain at 10 bit, we consider the accuracy loss is kind of minimized. So we choose 10 bit for the U-brain design. With the data precision in mind, okay, we moved to the hardware setup. We have four hardware the CPU, systolic array, the stochastic computing, and the U-brain. The difference between the uh, stochastic computing and the uh, U-brain is the multiplier. The multiplier of the stochastic computing is the classical one, but our U-brain used the proposed temporal multiplier. And the CPU is a just a nano. It has an ARM core inside, a fixed size memory, and a maximum uh, running frequency of 1400 megahertz. The systolic array has a maximum running frequency of 400 megahertz. However, you can see that for the uh, U-brain and the, the stochastic computing baseline uh, design, it can run at approximately four megahertz. This benefit is due to the immediate processing and it significantly lower the frequency and finally lower the power. We first check the overall total area of those designs. And for the sense part, because of the ATC design our work, we can reduce the sense area significantly. And for the store, we still need the DRAM to store the weight for the neural network. So uh, the system array SC and the U-brain has the same uh, storage, but smaller than the CPU baseline. Then for the compute, uh, U-brain has larger compute area compared to the system array because we allocate separate logics, hardware blocks 
for each layer. However, it's still smaller than the CPU and the SC baseline. Next is the power. We just examine the total power here. So because of the immediate signal processing, our U brain has a fixed latency and also for the SC because it just changed the multiplier to the old one. So it has a fixed latency and uh, we cannot change its running frequency. However, for the CPU and the C-solid array, we are able to change its frequency to meet different latency requirements. Here we show uh, what we can have. For example, for the CPU, it has a limited running frequency. So we tune the CPU to, uh, to, to traverse all possible frequency and show the power here. So relatively, uh, no matter how we tune the frequency of the CPU and uh, the six solid array, U brain always show the best power compared to the rest. So compared to, so U brain is 5.5, 1.6, and 1.1 better than the CPU, C solid array, and the SC DCIs. So finally, we we'll come to the conclusion. U brain introduced minimum accuracy loss via customized DNN. And second, your brain has higher po high power efficiency via immediate signal processing after sensing. The hardware efficiency is enabled by three features at the architecture level or microarchitecture level. First, interlayer hardware time efficient multiplexing. Second, analog to temporal conversion. And finally, the low cost temporal multiplier. Here comes to the end of this talk. Thank you for listening, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Hi. Hi, I'm Ustan Mubarak from the University of Lutheran Urbana Champaign. It was a great talk. Thank you very much. So, I have a question. You showed that for five bit, for U brain, accuracy decreased compared to four bit. So, why would you have lower accuracy for five bit than four bit? Oh, sorry, could you come closer? I cannot hear, oh, sorry. So one of your graphs showed that U brain had lower accuracy for by five bit precision, and has higher accuracy at four bit precision. Mm -hmm. So do you know why accuracy dropped when you increase the bit width? Okay, so for this, uh, okay, the question is uh, why, why U brain exhibit lower accuracy when the bit, uh, when the bit resolution is low. The, uh, the thing is U brain is, uh, is one kind of, uh, a unit computing is one kind of approximate computing, especially when it's, uh, it's calculating multiplication. So for approximate computing, when your data resolution is low, the relative error will be high. So in that case, uh, accuracy, accuracy naturally drops. And uh, in our design, we are not uh, doing that kind of fine tuning, I mean, retrain based on the data. So if we uh, figure out how to retrain according to a specific multiplier. So we can improve the error bar, uh, minimize the error bar, yeah. Okay, but, 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 but I noticed an anomaly there. So for five, five bit per cn, accuracy was lower than for four bit per cn. Oh, yeah. Then for that specific question, uh, our guess is, um, we didn't exactly examine this problem, but our guess is when the bit, uh, bit width is low, the accuracy is kind of unpredictable. Okay. So okay. this kind of variation is not uh, controllable. It's kind of decided by the random number generator we use. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. our guess. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Karthik Sriram from Yale University. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, great work, uh, very interesting research area. Um, how would your solution scale for much higher uh, sampling frequencies, for example, for invasive DCIs up to about 30,000 hertz. Do you have a sense for that? Oh, yeah. So currently our, uh, for our design, uh, the number of channels is just uh, at the 60 level around. Or if we want to scale the number of the input, we have to, we have to increase the number of uh, the size of the DM model. So in this case, we need better, uh, larger area. In this work, uh, our current solution is not that kind of scalable. If mm -hmm. we encounter, for example, over 3K number of input channels, in that case, we might need 
uh, a more reconfigurable one instead of the customized DN, customized hardware allocated to each layer. Yeah. I see. So that's for number of channels. I was wondering for uh, the frequency, like the number of um, samples coming per second. Uh, yes. Okay. So in terms of the frequency, uh, if we increase the number of channels, we might need a still larger uh, DN, and we need to. In, uh, if we want to keep the area unchanged, we need to increase the frequency so that we can run more neurons. I see. And so it'll just have the standard power scaling in that case? Yes. Increase the number. Uh, from that point of view, increase the number of uh, channels might increase the power. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So let's give the speaker a round of applause. <clears throat> Okay, our last speaker is George. So he's an assistant professor in uh, National University of Singapore. He works on DNA-based data storage. And in this talk, he's going to uh, talk, us, uh, talk about reliability in DNA storage. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Uh, but for some reason, no, we cannot. Um... Okay. Um, uh, my name is Georgi Evjic, and I'll be telling you about how to manage reliability in DNA data storage. Uh, so why would we go that far to store some data in DNA molecules? It sounds a little bit bizarre, but there has to be some great um, important reasons. One of the most important reasons is that DNA storage is incredible dense. It's orders of magnitude ahead of any alternatives that we know. It also, if engineered for durability, can the data in stored in DNA can last at least a billion times more than it can last on say a disk or, or flash device. Now speaking of disks and flashes, um, just like floppy disks, they come and go, hard disks also come and go, flashes come and go, and their interfaces are gonna be forgotten at some point soon, uh, but DNA is here to stay. So, uh, what is sure is that the interfaces, read-write interfaces to DNA are only going to be improving. Uh, and also what is quite a prominent feature of DNA storage is that it allows efficient random access at constant latency, regardless of how much data uh, you're looking at. And finally, something new, uh, which is a recently published paper from Luis and Karen in Nature Communications, which is, uh, showing how we can actually very efficiently uh, do very massive near data, uh, data parallel computations on data that is stored in DNA. And I do invite you to, to check out this paper. So why not DNA? What are the problems and challenges associated with DNA storage? Well, the most important thing certainly is the cost. If you look at the, the, the read-write interfaces, they are currently super expensive. Uh, the writing cost is about $1,000 per megabyte uh, at the appropriate scale. And the reading cost can also vary widely depending on if you need your data now or you need it in three months, in which case we can send it to China or Korea for sequencing. 
So it can vary quite a bit, but what is quite sure is that for a long time from now, we are going to be focused on how to minimize the use of these interfaces. How, how do I minimize the amount of data written in read from DNA storage? Uh, the other problem is that the read-write interfaces are also quite buggy and very error-prone, and the frequency and nature of these errors is very high, and the nature is very unusual. So the errors that happen here are very hard to manage and handle. Uh, we have to invest quite a bit of resources uh, into managing uh, errors. So about 20 to 30% of all resources uh, we invest is for redundancy and error correction. So it is very important that we handle the errors efficiently and uh, effectively. So here's the summary of this paper. The central observation in this paper is that if you look at one DNA molecule, so this is a string of, of letters that store some data. And if I look at different positions from zero to let's say L. So, and if I look at the reliability of data stored in these, uh, in these storage locations, so what we observe is that the reliability is actually quite skewed. So there are areas of very, very high reliability at the beginning and the end of the molecule, but the data in the middle is, shows very low reliability. And if the system is unaware of this, that, that can lead to a very uh, ineffective and inefficient error correction. So we propose two mitigation strategies. Uh, one of them is uh, inspired by Anthony Fauci and also the coding theory from wireless communication. So something like this is not used in storage systems. It's used in wireless communications, but it actually fits better here than it fits in any other wireless communication system. Uh, the, using this mechanism, we achieved the uniform reliability. Uh, the other mechanism we are proposing is, uh, is applicable to, to data that has a notion of quality, such as images and video data. And here we've noticed that different beats have different reliability needs. And so what we do is basically map data onto DNA molecules in a way that maximizes the quality of the retrieved data. Okay, so here's the outline of, outline of my talk. I will briefly talk about DNA storage basics and I will talk about the reliability problem and the mitigation techniques. So you may remember from uh, some biology, primary school, high school, that DNA is, uh, contains four building blocks, ACGT, ACGT uh, which could be uh, chained in a linear structure, such as string. Uh, so what the, what's interesting that we can do it artificially. So given any string of these letters, I can create an artificial molecule that has that content, and I can assign it some meaning. Now, this actually doesn't have any biological meaning, so you cannot get infected by COVID or something if you play with this. Uh, because we have four nucleotides, four bases, that means that one base can store two bits of information. Now, here's a photo of my parrot, which is a uh, binary stream. And now if I adopt this convention that 0, 0 maps to A and 1, 1 to T, I can simply go and take this binary stream and encode it into a string. And then I'm gonna send it, send a text file to a company in San Francisco that does the synthesis as a service. And I'm gonna get this DNA storage and I'm done. However, the problem is that the artificial DNA molecules cannot be very long. So beyond a few hundred of nucleotides, the yield drops down exponentially. So the practical lengths that we're looking at is really a few hundreds of nucleotides. So what do we do? If you have a big data, but small molecules, basically you need to split your data into chunks that can fit into those molecules, right? But what is really important is that the ch those chunks are ordered. Why they need to be ordered because the moment we put them in DNA, it becomes a soup. And then we cannot, we lose the ordering between different chunks. So we have to have explicitly, we have to order them. If we break them into pieces, we have to add some ordering information in every data chunk so we can reassemble back this into the original data. Okay. Now, to retrieve data from DNA, you have to go eventually through a process called DNA sequencing and there is many available technologies. So once you sequence your DNA, 
for every data chunk, you're typically going to get a number of reads, number of, of copies of the data. And some of these copies may be exact copies that, that you synthesize. Some of this may be, some of them may be buggy. In this case, I have a, a event that's called substitution where, where this G is, has mutated to A. Uh, a more problematic situation is if I have a deletion of some character, which is in this case between T and C, I deleted A and note that these has, have shifted to the left. Or I can have an insertion of a character and then I have, again, shifting of data. Or I have multi, can have multiple errors in the same DNA string. So these are some challenging errors that happen that do not happen in, in conventional uh, electronic systems. You don't, for example, uh, a capacitor in the DRAM does not disappear and shift other capacitor to the left, right? Or uh, these kind of things are very complex to deal with conventional, uh, uh, having conventional coding theory tools. Now, a couple of definitions here. So the Average number of reads for every data chunk has a name it's, uh, in, in bioinformatics, it's called sequencing coverage, right? And it's directly proportional to the reading cost. The more you have to read, uh, the higher the coverage and the higher the cost. And another uh, definition, which is important, and some papers in the afternoon are going to reference it, is edit distance between two strings, which is a distance metric that is defined between any two strings of any length um, and it is defined as the minimum number of single character operations that include uh, insertions, deletions, and substitutions needed to convert one string into another. Okay, so just have this definition in mind. Now, here's a puzzle for you. Uh, this is the output from a sequencing machine. Uh, and also there is a cheat sheet here. You know that zero, zero is A, one, one is T. And the question is now, what is the binary data that this represents? So what do we do now, right? So the first thing we need to notice is that while well, this data includes uh, noisy copies from different chunks, right? So the first thing I want to do is to group these reads according to whether they come from the same data chunk or not. So what I'm gonna do is clustering and the metric of similarity is going to be edit distance. Um, now I've clustered all my reads. What do I need to do now? For every cluster, I need to basically figure out if these are all the noisy copies that I, that I have, what is the actual data, right? So these are noisy copies of the data, but they need the data, right? So I have to somehow have some, some process of, of finding the consensus within the cluster of what the data actually is. And that's the key problem here. Now, once I've done this, I can just simply reorder this data and decode it. But looking back at this consensus finding problem in a cluster. Um, so let's assume that this is one cluster. So how do I find the consensus? So I'm, I'm just gonna give you some visual intuition as to why there is a problem here. Uh, so if I look at the first column, so the most, uh, it looks like it's mostly Gs. So I can actually safely say that this is likely a G character. And if I look, move down the next column, this looks like T, but next one, there is three A's and three C's and I'm not quite sure. And if you go down the path somewhere in the middle, you have no idea what's happening, right? But somebody else can say, well, I can align everything to the right. And now I can look at the last column is most likely to be C. And the one next to that looks like G. But if I go down the line, I'm again getting confused. What is this? So the, the, the intuition here is as you move down the line, the likelihood that your data has shifted is higher. So the uncertainty in your reconstruction is much higher. Um, so, and this actually is, is a fundamental problem in here in the edit distance. So it doesn't really matter what algorithm you're applying this construction, you're always going to end up with this skew. Some, some data is going to be easier to feed to that. So, uh, here I'm going, uh, on the x-axis is the position of the character, on the y-axis is the probability that they will incorrectly reconstruct that character. Depending on the number of parameters, which is the error rate, sequencing coverage, 
the, the breakdown of, of different time squares and so on. So what I want you to, to see is that like the, this reliability skew is quite kind of dynamic. It depends on in different clusters, it's going to be different in magnitude. So that means that it is going to be hard to apply some uh, to statically kind of compensate for this skew in using, using some coding techniques. So how do we actually deal with this problem? So uh, first, let's see how this is done in the state of the art. So these are five molecules. Remember that every molecule is a data chunk and has a ordering information in the yellow bar. Now, these are my data molecules, but I'm also going to have some redundancy molecules. This is for error correction. And what my code word is going to be is a column in, the, in this matrix. Right? So this is a very standard uh, outer code architecture in, uh, widely used in, in storage systems. So one, one row in this matrix could be, let's say, a disk sector. In this case, is a, uh, a data molecule. Now, if I look at two code words, X and Y, so X, if I look, let's say, if they have two errors happening in code word Y, I could correct them because they have two redundant characters. But what is likely to happen is code word Y is going to suffer much more errors than code word X because code word Y contains all the characters that are in the middle. Now, both, both code words actually have the same capacity to correct errors, but code word X is going to see way less errors compared to code word Y. So here is our solution. Uh, basically, we redefine what the code word X is by intermediating the cross columns. So the code word X and Y are going to be looking up, uh, like this now. And if I have the same time square, I right, can see even if the errors accumulate in this column, they're going to be dispersed across different code words. Right? And this way, I achieve quite uniform uh, reliability across all code words. The second solution, as I said, applies to only to data that has notional quality. And the good news is that it happens to be good with most of the data at all. So images and media is responsible for like 80% of the data. Uh, so the observation here is that some data needs are more, uh, more error tolerant than others, and they require less reliability in general. For example, a, a bit in a header file, the image is, and the, the, the corrupting a bit in a header file is going to be a catastrophe, but corrupting some irrelevant bit at the end of some compression sheet is not going to be very significant. Right, so uh, that's one observation. The other observation is that looking at this matrix, we can actually statically determine what is going to be the single most, most uh, reliable location and what is going to be the single least reliable location. So we can order all locations actually by reliability. We may not know the magnitude of that reliability skew, but we do know that we can know statically we can rank all locations by reliability. Now, the idea here is that we can sort all the beats in an image or video file by their error, error tolerance. And on the other hand, we sort all the locations by their reliability. And then we can map the, the, the most uh, error tolerant beat is going to go to the, uh, to the location with the uh, lowest reliability and vice versa. And it can be shown that this approach actually maximizes the, the, the quality of the, of the uh, retrieved images in the videos. Uh, so here is uh, just a couple of uh, evaluation highlights. I'm looking here, uh, we're showing here a bunch of images in one huge encoding matrix with 80-something uh, cohorts. And if you store it in the baseline mode, what you see that um, there's uh, significantly more errors in the code words that are in the middle. The baseline is remember that the, the, the code words are vertical, right? And those vertical code words in the middle are, are the most problematic. In our case, in case of uh, our proposal, when we flatten the curve, we see that the, 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 the reliability is quite uniform that every code word experiences the same, roughly the same number of errors. This actually has an implication on the reading cost. Because we, we, because we have this uniform uh, reliability, we can actually tolerate higher error rates. What that means, for example, is that we can actually uh, allow for lower sequencing coverage. So I can retrieve the same data 
as lower safety fuel coverage, and therefore by the, it, saving the cost directly. Uh, so here, for example, I can say thirty percent of the of the living cost. So finally, if I want to look at the quality of the retrieved images, uh, here I'm showing different colors represent different error rates that I expose the data to. Um, the, the full line shows the, the baseline architecture. Uh, the uh, dotted line shows the flattening, the, 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 flattening, the, the flattening curve, and the, dot, the, the dashed line shows the, the, uh, the graceful degrading of. Now, if I look at the red line, so we start with the sequencing coverage of 20. So the, the coverage, the lower the better. So I want to go down and reduce my coverage as much as possible, but I don't want to lose too much quality. Right, so this is the image quality loss in decibels, and mind you, this is the log scale. So, at the coverage of 20, everything's I'm able to decode everything perfectly. But at the coverage of 16, the baseline starts uh, degrading quality images sharply. If I look at this flattened curve approach, well, I can actually push this all the way up to 13. I can reduce my sequencing coverage. But what happens then is that all code words are actually going to uh, fail at the same time. And the property of, of modern error correction codes is that if you exceed the error correction capacity, they cannot do anything about it. They can just detect the situation. So the, what happens here is that basically if I look at the, 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 the last approach the, where I map the data by reliability, I can actually achieve graceful degradation. If I reduce the sequencing coverage, if I reduce the amount of resources that I invest in reading, I can actually get uh, graceful degradation. Okay, uh, in summary, um, the central observation of this paper is that regardless of how you organize the storage, some occasions in it are going to be of higher reliability than others. And if your system is not aware of that, you will be uh, using the error correction resources quite inefficiently and ineffective. So we propose two mitigation techniques. Uh, one is to flatten the curve and provide uniform reliability. Uh, this can reduce the reading cost by 30%. Or to provide a uh, mapping of data to DNA locations that's aware of this too, uh, in which case you can actually allow for graceful degradation and maximize the quality of retrieved images uh, for any new coverage. Uh, thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Hi, Nathan Blair, University of Bologna. Um, so say you, you have your photo of your parrot and you put it into DNA storage and three billion years from now, the Martian archeologists went to Earth, they, they get the DNA out of storage and they want to read, they want to see the photo of, of your parrot. Um, how are they going to know the file format with all these complicated, I mean, not to, with all these different uh, uh, air pressure coatings, et cetera, how are they going to know what that is when all of the sort of the legacy media has, has decayed and, and, and been destroyed. Uh, that's a great question. The question is, uh, well, the, the, this DNA, let me see if I understood. So the DNA lasts for long, let's say, for a thousand years. How is somebody going to, while we can read DNA, how is somebody going to format in which it's written? Well, you can say that for just about anything, right? So just any uh, data in your, in your image, right? So you have to know, you, you have to have a phone that has a decoding software for that image. Right. So, so yeah. Well, we need to find some kind of standard format, right? That will be valid in ten thousand years. So, yeah. I have a really interesting talk. My question is: to evaluate these schemes, did you have to actually send your data to San Francisco, send your uh, encoded data to San Francisco, or do you have some modeling tools to evaluate what would be the reliability? Of uh, of of the uh, So we, we did both, right? We we evaluated quite some data in the natural web lab, so it's kind of standard. I mean, a lot of this actually can be done as a commercial service, and very low there's very low like wet lab happening to tune. Right? So and what needs to be done is actually very like simple and you know, bread and butter for some te technicians, right? Um, but so we did both. And there is some difference in how we, the, the, not maybe related to this paper, but there is some difference in the data that, that 
that, that comes out from the real process and the data that you can simulate. Right? There is some differences uh, that are not significant for this paper, but there are differences. Right? So I think you do have some work that actually concerns precisely modeling, uh, like modeling this data to make sure it looks like the data. And behave like Hi, uh, I'm Pocket from Georgia Tech, and my question is that uh, so you're using the like traditional video guys, the you know forming video guys to record ECC data. Uh, is it possible to use like, a non canonical and other video types to store information more than that? Uh, yeah, there, there, there is something that's called non canonical nuclear times, which instead of having A, C, G, T, you're going to have, let's say, A plus, G star, C minus, and so on. So if you can have some uh, some engineered nuclear times that, for example, could chemically do something better. Um, that's great. However, the problem with that is that nobody in the medical field is going to be excited about this, right? So the, the great advantage of DNA storage is that we share some kind of common interest in medicine, right? So and biology. So we want to make sure we stay in line with like with what's happening in biology, right? That that so I, I cannot say much because I don't know how how the other alternatives like what are the properties of other twins. I know that I know that it do exist, right? But I, I doubt that it will be popular because of and nobody is going to invest into into rewriting this specifically so much for video storage if it's not usable for this. And I had another question about uh, I was seeing the paper and I saw that there were uh, if you had five parallel DNA strands and you can you know, identify the flips and you choose and see there's actually deletion or insertion. It's a little harder to identify. And it's possible to use uh, longest common substance out of the the uh, sequence genome to, to kind of identify where the mismatch occurred. Uh, you can you, you can use a bunch of algorithms that exist to identify what exactly has happened, but even that is not you know you're always dealing with assumptions and not necessarily all these all these tools are about I would say there's no ground truth. Right, because you don't know, let's say, if, if A was converted to T, or maybe it was a deletion of A and insertion of T. Right, so you cannot distinguish between these two. So it's actually hard to always know what has exactly happened. You can just assume what is more likely or slightly to happen. Yes, but you can use a bunch of those tools. They are not really, the, the bioinformatics tools are not super readily applicable here because there's a couple of key assumptions that are different. Uh, but there is a lot of algorithms that, that could be used somehow to improve this reconstruction process, but it will not affect the fact that you have this Thank you. Okay, so that concludes our session. So please give this again a round of applause.